embrace this urgency of creating the beloved community. Now is the time to be love. Love means understanding, redemptive goodwill toward all which seeks nothing in return. So be love by implementing the demands of justice to eliminate the school to prison pipeline that has so many black children entrapped. Be love by correcting voting policies that seek to suppress the votes of millions of black and brown people. Be love and implement the demands of justice by transforming a society that is disproportionately violent toward black lives, including black transgender lives and indigenous lives. Be love and correct false narratives and economic policies that continue to divide and pit poor and working class black and white people against each other. Be love and implement demands of justice where systems and structures are deconstructed and lead the way of living in community that reimagines just humane, equitable, and sustainable policies, practices, and behaviors. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them who hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. Be love and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Beloved Community Talks. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our beloved Community Talks on Racism and the Miseducation of America. Um, I am sure that many of you have been eagerly awaiting this conversation, and I have so looked forward to it as well, and we are finally here. What I want you to do is uh, to take this moment and invite others to join us in this conversation. And I say join us because I will not only be engaging our guest for tonight, you will also have an opportunity uh, to ask uh, questions um, after I engage it for a little bit. Uh, but take a moment now to invite those other individuals um, and give us some likes. We need some encouragement tonight as we are um, having this uh, necessary and essential conversation. Uh, many of you already know who our guest is and I wanna bring her in tonight. Um, uh, Jane Elliott, uh, she doesn't like to be referred to as Dr. Jane Elliott, uh, like me. I, tell people all the time when they ask me, do you wanna be called doctor, Reverend doctor or Bernice? I say to people, my name is Bernice. And in fact, my name has power in it. It means bringer of victory. So I prefer you to call me by my name. Uh, so I'm gonna call her Jane Elliott tonight. Um, she is a renowned educator um, who has a powerful voice of calling white people out and up to a right way of thinking that embraces the truth in other words, she speaks truth to power. That's what many of us know her as. Uh, she is a no-nonsense and frank voice speaking against discrimination and exposing racial prejudice and bigotry. Um, she is she's a lecturer, a diversity trainer, uh, and she consistently promotes that there is one race, which is the human race. I will be so glad, Dr. Elliott, when we get to the place in this world where people truly recognize that, but we got some work to do um, as we uh, address uh, all of the challenges around uh, racism and racial prejudice and discrimination. So thank you for joining me on tonight. Um, and guess what? You and I have something in common. We just recently, uh, uh, well, we will be appearing on the September cover of um, the British Vogue. And so congratulations <laughs> to you, uh, uh, Activism Now. We're the faith, can you believe it? I'm 57 no, and you are 80 something and we are the face of Activism Now. So that yeah. just goes to show you what my mother said. She said, struggle is a never ending process. 
freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And I think what she was saying there was not about an age, but the generation of time that each one, one of, oh, each one of us has an opportunity to live in. And so we live in this generation of time and we across uh, the span of generations represent uh, the voices and the faces of, of activism. And so congratulations to you on that. But tonight, um, we're going to have a, a, a very um, hopefully juicy conversation because I know uh, not, not only are, uh, are, are you extremely intriguing, um, you have a way of keeping it exciting. I call it edu entertainment. Um, I've been watching some of your interviews and I noticed you have this shirt sweatshirt that you constantly wear. I don't think we can quite see it tonight, um, but lift, lift it up for us. Yeah. <laughs> so call it, this is an prejudice, experience. Yes. Right there. Pre prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. And you told me tonight you added the word racial prejudice right. is an emotional commitment to ignorance. Well, my father said something and he said, Nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And so I, I just want to focus on this word ignorance, because when we think about racism, um, not just in America, but in, in, our, in our world, um, there is a lot of ignorance in our world. But um, the fact of the matter is information is at a premium and there really is no excuse for people um, to be ignorant. And so what do you, what do we do about all of these people are choosing to hide behind ignorance? You have to remember that what we we're experiencing and what we're dealing with is self-imposed ignorance. All the mm. information is out there and has been out there for about 250 years. There's absolutely no excuse for st people still believing in the myth of more than one of three or four races. There's only one race. Victor Hugo said it best. And he, he was talking, I think, about your father before he knew of anything about your father. He said, no power on earth can stop a man with a dream or an idea whose time has come. Mm -hmm. I think your father had a dream and it is more alive now than it was when he was living because you can't stop that dream. You can't stop the dream of people treating one another fairly and, and refusing to go along with the ignorance of racism. And no power on earth is going to be able to stop the idea of one race. That is an idea whose time has come. If you want to make a difference in the way people treat one another in this in this world, and particularly in this country, which calls itself the leader of the Western world, then we have to put a stop to the ignorance of racism. And that means we have to re-educate the educators. And we have to do mm. it before school starts. Because when school starts, they're going to go right back to talking about Columbus, who discovered America. You can't discover wow. a place where people are already living. They discovered it before you got there. It's time for us to start teaching the truth. And it's time for parents to go to the schools and demand that teachers teach the truth. We have taught anti-social studies long enough. Now it's time to teach real social studies, which means we're going to start teaching the truth. Wow, I, I, I'm glad you, you said that because um, um, I'm trying to adjust. Who's that said no lie can live forever? Um, we're in a season now where truth has to be um, enthroned and lies have to be dethroned. Um, I want to say that again to everybody listening. We have to enthrone the truth and dethrone um, lies in, in our nation because so often we have been uh, allowing ourselves to be led by lies. Um, so with that in mind, you know, I just want to remind people of something that occurred um, 52 years ago, I believe, with you. It's where a lot of your work began um, on this journey of being what they call today an anti-racist, I would say a person committed to eradicating racism, um, because we often say we don't want to just talk about what we're against, but we want to talk about what we're for. And I know you're for racial um, equity and equality. Um, but 52 years ago, when my father was assassinated, um, you were moved to do an experiment uh, with blue eyes and, and brown eyes. Uh, to press the point about the, the the discrimination, racial discrimination that had been happening um, or that not just had been then, but continues, but was happening um, in our society. 
um, and you've been on this journey for a long time. I'm wondering if we fast forward to everything that you have learned and everything that has occurred since that assassination, uh, would you redo that experiment the same way you've done it in light of George Floyd now, um, in light of the Black Lives Matter protests um, and movement that's been happening recently um, on the heels of, of our pandemic as well? Would you, would, you, would you do the same experiment or what would you say to a group of educators today, as many of them, as you just said, are going back to school now, some of them virtually, some of them in person, um, what would you have them do by way of an experiment uh, today? The first thing I do is stop referring to what I do as an experiment. And you're not, you're okay. not at fault. That's the way everybody describes it. And for many people, when they call it an experiment, they're trying to lessen its effect and to make it wrong. It's wrong. So to it's an experience. It's Was an it experience. an experience? Yes. yes. Yes, it's an experience. Because you see, when I separate people according to on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they have absolutely no control and treat those who have the right characteristic fine and those who don't have that right characteristic badly, if that's an experiment, then what we have been doing with black and brown and yellow and red and so-called people in this country for the last 300 years has been an experiment. It's illegal. Mm. Mm. It's unethical. It ought not to be happening. But if what I do is an experiment, then what we've been doing in this country has been an experiment. You need to realize that. And I'm not anti-racist. I am pro-human. I am right. pro-seeing exactly. every human, every person on the face of the earth as a member of the same race. These um, people of different skin colors are my different, different skin folks are my kin folks. You need to realize that. As far as I'm concerned, you and I are 30th to 50th cousins. And we've got to convince people of the truth of the fact of that matter. That's the way it is. If we traced our DNA back far enough, every one of us would find a percentage of, of our DNA came from a country on the continent of Africa every single human being on the face of the earth. And it's time for us to realize that. And it's time to realize that when you teach as if there are two or three races, you are not being stupid. You can't fix stupid. You can fix ignorant. So what, that's what I mean when I say we have to re-educate the educators. Every educator should read uh, the Nathan Rutstein's book that this statement came out of. And it is about the trying to change the psychological genocide that's going on in the schools with our children. We have to teach children, we have to teach educators that we do not our, allow ourselves or our students to talk about different races. You wanna talk about different color groups? You wanna talk about different cultural groups? You wanna talk about different ages, different stages, different nationalities, that's fine, but not different races. And without, <laughs> without fail, when somebody introduces me, they say there are many races on the face of the earth and Mrs. Elliot is, no, there's only one and you and I are members of it. You're my 30th to 50th cousin, whether you like it or not. Now, our skin color is a whole lot closer than the color of my skin and the color of my hair and the color of my shirt. My shirt and my hair are white. My skin is not. White people do not exist on the face of the earth. We are all shades of brown. And the only reason white and black came up during the Spanish Inquisition is because white is the color of purity and goodness. Black is the color of savagery and badness. And that's the reason that it's white versus black. We need to realize that we have been conned dreadfully for the last 400 years. You also need to realize that the reason we're having a lot of trouble getting rid of racism is because racism makes money. Yes. Racism. Yeah. Racism is a very lucrative project. And as long as we it can is. keep people, yes, yeah, as long as we can keep people at each other's throats and blame it on skin color, that's how long we can continue to make money off of racism. That's how long we can keep black males in jails and in prisons working for 22 cents an hour and their mo the money they make goes to the victim of their crimes. Now, if they were victimless crimes, as they were, as many of them were during the, during the, <laughs> what's his name's years, Bill Clinton's years, then those guys are still in jail right now. For victimless crimes, they're still there. This, this kind of thing has to stop. But you see, you can send your raw materials into a prison and have products made at a very cheap price and sell them for the same price that you would sell them for if they, you had had to import them from another country. Our prison industrial system is an extremely lucrative business. You need to realize that, and I think people don't. I think people don't realize what's happening under their very eyes. And if you haven't read, who's who wrote that wonderful book, um, the, the New Jim Crow? 
Michelle Alexander. If you haven't read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, folks watching this, you need to read that book because it will it will just make you absolutely furious when you realize what's happening right now. And The Color of Law, too. Um, I think you, oh, you oh, mentioned that book as well. Yes. Oh, The Color of Law is full <laughs> of information that it never occurred to me that I just thought that segregation was de facto segregation. People just don't right. want to live with those who are different from themselves. Number one, we aren't that different from one another. You need to realize that. Number two, it's a pleasure to live with people who are different from yourself because you get a different perspective on everything. But the, and the color of law tells us that the people who wrote the laws in this country and who are still writing the laws in this country actually believe in the myth of more than one race. And there's a great book mm -hmm. written by uh, Robert Wald Sussman, the, the Myth of Race. The book is fantastic. It's full of good information, well-researched. The only problem with it is he has the wrong title. The myth of race isn't a myth. A myth is something that you make up to explain something that happens in nature that you don't understand. A lie mm -hmm. is something you make up to justify your unacceptable behaviors. But he couldn't call it the lie of race, race because it wouldn't have gotten published and no one would have read it. No white folks would have read that. But if he calls exactly. it the myth of race, then we white folks like to think that it's a myth and we understand about myths. We don't want to realize that it is a lie. It was a lie made up to keep one group on top and everybody else subjugated to them. We also need to realize, white folks need to realize, number one, that they aren't white. Number two, that only 25% of the population of the earth is, is classified as white. 25%, the other 75% are people of color. And white folks in this country right now are really worried because they know that the demographics of this country say that within 30 years, within 30 years, white people will be a numerical minority in the United States of America. And that's the reason we're going to stop letting white women get abortions. We're going to close up all those Planned Parenthood clinics because in 1987, when this nonsense began and when that list of white privileges was written, 60% of the fetuses that were aborted every year were white. In the last two years, only 39% of the fetuses that were aborted were white. You see, we're making progress in keeping Amer a white people the the main the large the largest group in the United States of America. That that's only <laughs> I, I shut me up. Say something because if you don't, I'm gonna <laughs> I know, but but you're you're giving good information and we 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 appreciate that because you're educating so many well, of us on on tonight. But, but I I, I want to ask you this question. Um, you 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 have a lot of passion. Um, and you've been going strong for 52 years. And I just, I, I want to applaud you for that. And, I'm, you know, there may have been, you know, peaks and valleys in the process, but the fact is you have this, this staying power and, and, and you can feel and sense your energy and your commitment and your determination. And it's, it's almost like um, this is your time and this is your season. Um, I don't know, what do you think about, uh, the, the white population in general now, do you feel that this is a moment where there is a great awakening happening? Um, is the truth of what you have been talking about for years that perhaps has been falling on deaf ears, is that now, um, you know, ringing a bell with some of the white community? Because my father said a sound resolution of the race problem in America will rest with those white men and women who consider themselves as generous and decent human beings. He was absolutely right. But you see right now, what we're dealing with now is that marvelous, huge group of children. They aren't children, but everybody's younger than I am. So I call them children. All those young people out in the streets protesting what finally we got to see, and there's no, you can't deny what the police were doing to those young black males. One kneeling on his neck until he died, waiting until he was dead. Another shooting one because a man had, had overpowered two policemen and taken the tater away from him, disarmed one of them without any help from anybody else, and then ran away to avoid making a bad, making a mistake. Then the other policeman, steps up and shoots him. We got to see that. Black people have been seeing that in this country for over 300 years. But we, we 
pale faces have been denying that it's happening because we weren't there when it happened. And we know that policemen are on the plate, on the scene to protect and defend us. Well, but and, and can I say something? Can sure. I say something? We as black people are tired too. Um, <laughs> we, we're tired because we've been on the front line of this whole, we've been the, the victims of the recipients of it. And we've also had to rise to the occasion to enlighten the conscience uh, of, of white America. And what's, many, what's, many are tired now. But what's worse than that is you not only have been expected to put up with it, but you have also been expected to forgive and forget and smile. Mm -hmm. And you've been expected to be yes. more humane than any white people. You've been expected to be more forgiving. You've been expected to de develop wonderful coping, coping skills. You've been expected to be more than the people who have called you inferior, uh, expect you to be, and more than they recognize what you are. We refuse to recognize the fantastic intelligence of those first black people who left the area of the equator and moved without any technological, none of the, none of the modern technological stuff to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. And they did that. They were, if they showed their creativity, they showed their courage, they showed their curiosity, they showed their intelligence, they showed all that, those aspects that we deny being in people of color other than the white group. And how we have managed to do that is more than I know, but we have deliberately we have deliberately lied to ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. It's been going on for 300, only three, about between three, three and 400 years. We need to put a stop to it and we need to put a stop to it now. It's time for us to realize how fantastic, let me, let me make something perfectly clear here. My heroes are black women. And it's not because I'm talking to you as a black woman. I'm talking to you as a member of my race. And women of color have shown themselves to be more forgiving more understanding, more accepting, more tolerant than any white person I know. And I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And not, it's not because of a, an X quality, it's because they have learned how to survive in an environment that says they can't. I will not forget the young black woman who stood beside me at a major university in the Northeastern part of the United States. And we were talking about differences. And I, she kept saying when we, yes, the audience and these were and the members of the audience were all department heads in this in this university. So we were talking about differences and the tall white man was on my left and this tall, taller black woman was on my right. And I said to the audience, hoping they'd pass the test. Do you see any differences here? I hoped they would say the one thing they saw first. They saw height. They saw gender. They saw age. And then finally, finally, one of them said color. And I said, thank you very much. Are you talking about hair color or skin color? She said, skin color. And I said to this black woman, I said to the white male, is your skin color important to you? He said, I never have to think of it. And I thought, you lucky, yes. Oh, oh, oh. I thought unpleasant things. So I turned to this black and I said, does your skin color give you power? Yes, I'm, I'm strong. I, I said, is there anything you fear? I'm not afraid of anything. So I turned to this black woman and I said, is your skin color important to you? Does it give you power? And she waited for a long, long minute. And then finally she said, I'm going to say something I've never said out loud before. I said, and that's because, she said, because I'm ashamed of it. I said, and that would be, she said, I have two children. Both of them are girls. Both times, and this makes me sick because it, it was such an awful moment. She said, both times when I was pregnant, I prayed that I wouldn't have a son. I mm. said, and that's because, because I didn't want to think of what he'd have to go through and what I'd have to go through when I lost him. Mm -hmm. And she didn't say if I lost him. She said, when I lost him, there wasn't a sound in that room. Every one of those educated educators knew at that moment that they had flunked the test. They saw her color first, but we have been taught in this country to pretend we don't see color because there's something wrong with skin color. No, there's not. The first people on, that evolved on this earth, the first human beings were very, very dark skin because they're exposed to a lot of sunlight. It's time to right. stop having people say to one another, when I see you, I don't see you black. How dare you say that to another person? And right. how dare, how dare an instructor at another college stand up in the group and say to me, I just look for the person's heart. I said, well, if you can see my heart from where you're sitting, you need to get out to the local hospital and volunteer to be there, <laughs> volunteer to be there x-ray machine. Cause you can save them a lot yes. of money. She said, you don't understand. I said, I understand perfectly. What you're telling me is you don't, 
can't relate to someone who has skin that is a different color than yours. So you just look inside at my heart. You can't see my heart. And if you could, you'd realize that my heart has a lot of color in it. And so does everybody else's. See, yes, we've got and, to and recognize he, that we've got to recognize the racism in things like some white woman walking up to me and saying, I'm colorblind. I say, oh, you wouldn't have to tell me that. I knew that before you said it, because if you weren't colorblind, you wouldn't wear that shirt with that skirt. And then she gets angry <laughs> because I have offended her. But I have I am offended yes. when somebody says they don't see my skin color because they wouldn't say that to me if I were black. Yes, I, I, I get offended by that as, as well. I think a lot of people uh, take my father's um, um, statement out of context so many times to justify a colorblind world. And that's definitely not what he was um, um, speaking about it all, but I, I want to, I want to go to, to another area because, you know, at the end of the day, if we end up getting everybody re-educated in the truth, um, and now you have all of these educated people, um, and what, what do we do beyond education? Because it's one thing when we're talking about educating ourselves so that we're not uh, racially ignorant or that we don't have racial prejudice. But it's another thing when we're talking about systemic and structural racism and institutional racism. How how do we address that? Because it goes beyond just education. My father, in fact, said education uh, without social action is a one-sided value because it has no true power potential. Uh, so what is what is what's beyond education that people can begin to do who are educated because i have some friends who've been educating themselves for a long time now who are white um but something has to happen for us to deal with systemic racism well you have to number one stop calling your friends white because they aren't you need to call them melanemic if you have too melanemic iron, if you have too little iron in your blood you're anemic so if you have too little melanin in your skin you're melanemic <laughs> I'm going to tell them. Uh, I'm going to tell Jennifer melanemic. That's right. That's my melanemic right. You, friend. You remind them that they aren't white because they aren't the color of my shirt and they aren't the color of my hair. And neither is anybody else unless you are in Tanzania and you're a member of that group of albinos. That's a whole different thing. I don't see many albinos. In fact, I see very few. The first thing we have to do is change. We've got to get our vocabulary into the 21st century. You can't use language. 16th and 17th century language to change things in the 21st century. We've got to start using, stop using words like biracial and multiracial and, and all these ignorant terms that go along with believing in the myth of several different races. We have to put a stop to that. We have to change our language. And my next project is to get my daughter to illustrate a book with lots and lots of words from the 16th and 17th century and pictures that demonstrate those words and then use the then use those words other words for the 21st century we don't men very if you if you're going to continue to to live in the racist 15th 16th 17th century then you're going to want to give up everything that we have in the 21st century there'll be no more programs like this because we'll have no electricity We'll have we'll have no highways. We'll have no super highways. We'll have no elect. We'll have no no central heating. We'll have no air conditioning. We'll have no books. We'll go back to the 16th, 17th century. I don't don't think that many of your male friends are going to want to wear knee stockings and powdered wigs. <laughs> but if you insist on using the language from that time, then you'd better use the means of transportation from that time. Everybody, go out and buy a horse. This is ridiculous. This is how ridiculous this whole thing is. We want to carry over the nonsense from former centuries, but we want to use, we want to enjoy the modern technology of this century. We've got, you cannot continue to mix them because it's messing us up. It's messing us up horribly. It, <laughs> when people see my face on television, they cannot see a white woman. They want to see a white woman, but I'm not. Mm. That's all there is to it. They can call you can if there's there's a way to there's a way to deal with that. Go to the thesaurus, find all the the synonyms you can for brown. There are over a hundred. There are over a hundred different skin tones, and they're all shades of brown on the face of the earth. 
thousands of different skin tones on the face of the earth, and they're all shades of brown. They aren't white. So let's let's bring us into the 21st century language wise. And that that means that we're going to have to stop indoctrinating students and start educating them. In this country, we indoctrinate students so we can make them into good American citizens. We've got to change that statement. This is not people in this country are quite certain that America is the 48 contiguous states and Alaska and Hawaii and the islands off the southeastern coast of the United States. That's not all of America. America is everything from the northernmost point of Canada to the southernmost point of South America. All those people in, in that area are Americans. We've got to stop saying, as our presidents always do, God bless you and God bless America. No, they don't mean God bless America. If they did, they wouldn't build a wall on the southern border of the United States to keep those folks who aren't mm -hmm. Americans out. They are Americans. We've got to change our vocabulary and start referring to the USA instead of America. We've got so to stop change, this. So, let me arrogance. just ask you this: in changing the vocabulary, how do we translate that into creating a more equitable corporate America, where we don't see many uh, people uh, of my hue in the boardroom, um, in the executive suites? Um, I mean, it's, it's throughout uh, corporate America. What, what, what is the solution there? Again, we have all this knowledge. We have this information. Maybe even people are educated, but our systems and structures keep perpetuating themselves. Read Robert Reich's book, The System. Who rigged the it? The System by Robert Reich. Mm -hmm. Who rigged it and how to fix it? And here's another thing you can do. And this is a cheap and easy thing to do. Get this magazine. Do you see these two little girls? Would mm -hmm. you say that they would you say that they are biracial? In our current uh terminology? Yeah. Probably so. Yeah, well they aren't. They aren't biracial. They are members of the same race, the same race that you and I are. These are not biracial children. These are mosaic right. children. A mosaic is something an, an art form that is new and beautiful and made of many elements. That's what these two girls are. These are not black and white. This is a number one. This is a bad title for this, but inside this magazine is some of the most remarkable stuff. One of it is uh, the a whole page, three pages of people of different skin tones. It is absolute, see if you can find that, Sarah. It is absolutely beautiful. And it also has the map that shows where we all began. Look at this, look at these, look at these. These are all citizens of this country. Of the world, all, of, of this world. world. And all of, all of different colors, different people. Colors. These are all Huge. equally human, human beings. You have to realize that. And underneath them, it says Pantone and then a number. You can find your skin color on the Pantone color wheel. If I were teaching this year, I would have a copy of the Pantone color wheel or something that approximates that in my classroom. And I would have every child go up and put his or her face against those, that color wheel until they find the color of their skin. Instead of mm. calling anybody black and white, I would say, wait, you're number 632. You're beautiful. You're number 596. You're lovely. You're absolutely love. You're lovely. You're all beautiful. This is a color wheel of humanity. And then farther on in this, find the... the map. It sh there's a map that shows you where human beings started and how they moved over the face of the earth to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. They came yes. to North America about what, 10,000, 12, 11,000 years ago. So that what we call native Indians, they are not Indians. They were black people who left Africa. And as they moved farther and farther from the equator, their skin, their hair, and their eyes got lighter because we're exposed to less and less sunlight. Look at this map. This shows where we all came from and how they moved to to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. And they got to this continent about 20,000 to 15,000 to 20,000 years ago. Look at that. This is how it all began. It began in Africa. It did not begin in the Caucasus Mountains. It's time to get rid of the word Caucasian because it isn't true. We didn't evolve in the Caucasus Mountains. We came from Africa. Every one of us. It's time. Everybody to originated in Africa. Civilization Everybody. began in Africa. We all originated from Africa. I want to encourage you to post any of your questions um, so that we can begin to engage uh, Jane in this conversation. 
Uh, so feel free to post your questions. I know some of you have been making comments, but we certainly welcome your, your uh, questions on tonight as well. Um, how, do, how do you think this miseducation that has taken place um, in America, in your, in your uh, uh, opinion, how has it affected the psyche of, 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 of my community? Um, and there's been a lot of damage, as you know. Absolutely, but it, all, it hasn't just damaged black people. It has it's damaged everybody. Damaged, it has also damaged white people because yeah. it, has, it has given white people a willingness to agree with the list of white privileges. Have you read mm. that list of white privileges? Mm -mm. Well, Where you is need that? To read it. it. You can find that. Look, Google that, and it's, okay. it's um, Peggy McIntosh's list of white privileges, and she wrote it in 1987. She's a college professor. The woman's brilliant. However, every one of those privileges says, "I can buy a house in the neighborhood in which I want to live without being refused the, the house because of my race. I can stand up and make a statement and not have my a statement criticized because of my race." Practically every statement of that says because of my race. Well, we're all members of the same race. So that state, that whole thing makes no sense, you see. But in 1987, we believed in the myth of race and it's a lie. We have to realize that white privilege is not the problem. The problem is ignorance of people who don't realize that they aren't white. We've got, can you imagine a world in which everybody saw everybody else as a human being de deserving equitable treatment under the law just because they were human beings and not having it conditioned on the color of their skin. You know, we could have that. What and, you just said, so can I pause this for a moment? What you just said is really what the beloved community is about. And that's the world that we need to be focusing our attention on and building. Um, and so thank you for saying that. And there's a question that somebody wanted to ask you um, and that is, what's a better word for racism if it's not about race? A better word for racism is ignorance. Racism is the result of ignorance, not mm. knowing. And you don't have to, you don't have to be ignorant about race anymore because the books are out there. If you haven't read Andrew, Anthony Browder's book, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, you'd better get it, people, and read it because when you do, you will find out that 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, black people in the Nile Valley, which is in Egypt, and Egypt is a country on the continent of Africa. It is not in the Middle East, but we've moved it over into the Middle East so that we don't have to admit that all those wonderful things we got from Egyptians came to us from black people. Read that book and realize that before, many thousands of years before white folks realized what was going on, people in the Nile Valley, people of color, we're, used, we're doing cataract surgery with metal instruments on people's eyes long before there was any such thing done, wow. and there, long before there was the United States of America. So this, this whole thing has to stop. Somebody says, how do you begin the conversation about anti-racism and a raceless society with your young children? We aren't going to have a raceless society. We're always going to have a human race society. So you don't want to talk about raceless society because we're all members of a race, the human race, but you have to be opposed to people who speak as though there are two or three different races and as though skin color had anything to do with intelligence. Make no mistake about this. The fact that I have less melanin in my skin than you have does not make me smarter than you are. You have probably forgotten more since breakfast than I will ever learn about racism because you have mm -hmm. to in order to survive. I don't have to. That's another advantage that I have that ignorance gives me. Ignorance gives white folks the advantage to, to remain ignorant. So somebody asked, how do you deliver a one-year curriculum in this topic, including updating vocabulary terms? Well, I did it with third graders. And if I can do it with third graders, other people can do it with sixth, eighth, tenth, and twelfth graders. And what you do is, number one, now I wouldn't advise every teacher to do the exercise, the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, because you and I both know that there are a whole lot of people in classrooms who are teachers and not educators and who see mm. black boys and girls as less than already. So you are not going to put this exercise in the hands of a racist teacher. And there are lots of, there are most, race, te most teachers are racist because it works. It works being a racist in this country as an educator works. They depend on, the communities depend on you perpetuating the status quo. And the status quo is white people. And then in the, if you've read Andrew Hacker's book, 
uh, black and white, separate and unequal, everybody should read Andrew Hacker's book. And you'd realize where we are on the continuum of ignorance to knowledge. And where we are is we're still ignorant because we don't, we're afraid to teach the truth. Most of us were, were never taught the truth, so we don't teach the truth. And when you read <laughs> the color of law, you'll realize that the lawyers who wrote the law believed in the myth of several different races. Right. <laughs> Most, yeah, so, so if lawyers were that ignorant, why wouldn't plumbers? And why wouldn't housewives and how, right. how, why wouldn't the retail grocers all be equally ignorant? If that's the way you're supposed to behave, the way lawyers do, and they're, they're obviously racist in the laws that they've written in the last 300 years in this country. You have to read the book, The Color of Law. It will change the yeah. way you yeah. see your world. And I would, yeah. I would if, I were, if I were an administrator, I would say to the teachers, all right, now here's a list of books. And I expect every one of, every one of you to read one of these per month for the rest of wow. the year until you have read all of them. And now teachers are going to say, I don't get paid enough to do that. And to which I'm going to say, if you don't do it, you won't get paid at all because you'll be working somewhere else. Wow, that's 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 powerful. We, I, I wanna ask you one um, last question because I think we may have one or two before we close out. There's a question here, Andre Lamoth said, how do we go about making sure and changing the language of who people are that we aren't masking the insidious of the ideology of white supremacy from being hidden and perpetuated? Wow. Because we, we expose the myth of white superiority. We expose the myth by looking at the history and the real history. We expose the myth by going to An Anthony Browder. We expose the myth by going to all these people who know the truth and who have been writing the truth that we refuse to read and we free, we refuse to change. Tra change is the hardest thing for educators to do. We learned what we're supposed to teach when we were in college. We learned what we're supposed to know when we were in high school. They've done studies in this country that prove that the longer you stay in school, the more bigoted you become because every year you are reinforced in what you learn grades K through eight. So we need to change what we're teaching in grades K through eight and teach the truth. Administrators need to say to their teachers at the beginning of the year, these are the things you are not going to do. You are not going to expect, expect less of any child based on that child's skin color. And you're not going to expect more of any child based on that child's skin color. I thought I knew about expectations until I did the blue eyed, brown eyed exercise. And then in my classroom that year, there were four dyslexic boys, brown eyed. On the day they were on the top in that exercise, they read words I knew they couldn't read and they spelled words I knew they couldn't spell. And at the same time, I had Carol, the Lutheran minister's daughter, who came into my room in February reading at the sixth grade level. On the day she was on the bottom because she had blue eyes, she forgot how to read. She forgot she couldn't. She made mistakes in reading. She made mistakes in spelling and she forgot how to multiply. Now, that all happened to her because I lowered my expectations for her. She went through that for one day and mm. couldn't achieve academically after it. Imagine what happens to little black boys, especially boys, because it's worse for black boys because we'll accept black girls because we don't see them as ever going to be powerful. But black boys is another thing. And we have, and if you, oh Lord, that's another book you ought to read. And I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it doesn't matter. But you need to realize that if we would start expecting great things from children, we will get great things from children. But as long as you are have been indoctrinated with the myth of the superiority of people who have, have less melanin in their skin, you will expect less from the children of color than you do from the children who are colorless. And that is part of, that is a major problem in education in this country today, and it has been for the last 300 years. We need to fix it, and we need to fix it now. And that should be in our teachers' contracts. I will not teach in a racist way. And no teacher is going to, they won't sign it because they don't know. If, if they would just agree to use this, Peter's projection map, instead of the Mercator map. Mm -hmm. You see this, you see, you see Greenland here? You can't mm -hmm. see it because Greenland on this map is the size that it's supposed to be, right there. Mm -hmm. Greenland is not a great big ripe plum hanging down in the middle of the map. But you see on the Mercator map, everything in the Northern hemisphere which is actually two thirds of the map, it's mostly white countries. So that's bigger than the countries in the Southern hemisphere. 
at the bottom of the Mercator map is a, is a legend. And the last sentence of that legend says, South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. Now, did you know that? Hmm. Does it matter? Hmm. Hell yes, it matters. Mm -hmm. It matters a lot because what you do with this is, this is the Peter's map. So these shapes are distorted, but the sizes and the locations are right. Everybody needs to get a copy of this map and send it to school with their child. Get it laminated first, send it to school with your child and say, this is the map I want my child to see in the classroom. On this map, the equator is halfway down the map instead of two thirds of the way down the map, the way it is on the Mercator map. Do you have a copy of the Mercator map, Andy? No. Nope. Well, get one. So, so, so we're gonna. You, you have you have filled us up tonight, um, and we started with uh, racism and the miseducation of America. And what has happened on tonight, Jane, is that we, you have re-educated America on the night, and I want to thank you. Uh, for joining me. I wish we had more time to have these discussions, but this has truly been enlightening, educational. And to those of you who have been listening, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the, the questions. There's always more questions uh, when you have teaching like this. Uh, the reality is that change begins with each one of us. And the things that she recommended tonight, the readings that she recommended tonight, we've got to read those uh, works and we've got to get them in, in us and we've got to begin the process of recalibrating um, and recreating a new America. We have to change our vocabulary and our language. Um, and then we have to begin to deconstruct and reconstruct our systems um, in America. And, and so that is your assignment tonight. Take this wait, conversation. Wait, wait. Can Take I say this one more thing? They're going to get me, but uh, I, I have to yield to you. But they told me okay. to wrap up. But go ahead. Go to my go to my website and download the printed learning materials. The first is a set of statements, typical statements that white folks make that think they aren't racist. The second set is a clarification of those statements. The third set, and this is what you have to do, is a set of commitments to combat racism. Pick out mm -hmm. one of those that you've never done and do it for a month. And then read every book in the bibliography. Educate yourselves, okay? Yes, educate. That's the key. Miseducation, that means we have to be re-educated. Um, I think the book you were referring to earlier was The Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys by Jawanza Kunjufu. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, get with some of the, the friends in your circle. Um, take this conversation there. Begin to re-educate. I'm going to say re-educate because all of us need to be re-educated. Um, what, whatever we call ourselves in this country, but as part of the human race in the world house, as my father called it, we are members of a family in this world house. Uh, we have to begin to change the trajectory of our nation. So plan, put together a plan of action once you do that to determine what you can do, because all of us are gonna be held accountable um, to this process. It's not gonna be one person that will change uh, the course of this world. It will be all of us doing our part. So thank you, uh, Jane, for being here with us. I thank God for giving you longevity, and I pray that he continue to give you even more longevity uh, as you re-educate us in this uh, country we call the United States of America and as it goes all across the world. Mm -hmm.